and welcome the opportunity that I have to come here to speak on this subject. I trust that the Lord will guide and help us as we come to the consideration of the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. In common with the statement of faith which Mr. Oldham quoted, in connection with this chapel, the basis of the Trinitarian Bible Society also acknowledges the Holy Scriptures as given by inspiration of God and as the sole, supreme, and infallible rule of faith and practice. And that the words call to our remembrance some words written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy in the second epistle, third chapter, and sixteenth verse, where he says expressly that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In the chapter that we read, in the very last verse, uh, from the second epistle of Peter, chapter three, it was the word of exaltation, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. And that we are reminded by that verse of the, the purpose of God in giving his word by the inspiration of his Holy Spirit that his redeemed people would have the means of growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And with that in view, the Apostle Peter includes in this chapter, at the beginning, these words. He tells his readers that his object in writing was to stir up their pure minds and to put them in remembrance that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the Holy Prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. And he alludes to a body of scriptures, the Old Testament and the New. What had been written before and spoken before by the Holy Prophets and what had been spoken and written then in more recent times by the apostles. So he constrains his readers to fix their attention upon the Holy Scriptures, the revelation that God gave through the prophets in the Old Testament and through the apostles in the New. There's a recognition there, and one of the earliest, perhaps, uh, recognitions of what we might describe uh, as a canon of Holy Scripture, a rule embodying the recognition of the Holy Scriptures of the Old Testament and the New. Uh, and it might be profitable for us first to look back into the Old Testament and uh, gather up some of the testimonies of God's Word concerning its own divine origin, inspiration, and authority. When we use the word inspiration, we do well if we remember its precise meaning. It has to do with breathing and breath. And those words of the Apostle Paul tell us that the Holy Scriptures come to us as the breath of God. God himself has breathed forth his word. He has given his word by inspiration. And we're reminded also that the name by which the Holy Spirit is named in the Greek scriptures is the same word as one would use for the breath or the wind. Uh, and we are reminded that the Holy Scriptures come to us uh, as the breath of God. God breathed, the word has gone forth out of the mouth of the Almighty. And that there are many scriptures which remind us of this fact. And we'll turn this off in first in Exodus chapter 20. 
where one of God's servants stands before the people and speaks in this way. And God speaks all these words. And in due time, Moses came to write that declaration. That God speaks all these words. You remember that the Lord Jesus, when he was upon earth, said, And Moses wrote of me. And except you believe Moses, how can you believe me? And in dealing with the temptations of Satan, the Lord Jesus uh, quotes words written by Moses and then uh, adds this declaration that man cannot live, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word that is breathed forth by God, every word that is given by inspiration of God. That is the declaration of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in connection with Moses uh, and other Old Testament writers endorsing what Moses said that God speak all these words. And in chapter 24 and verse 3 And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said all the words which the Lord has said will be good. In other words, they acknowledged them that they would follow this rule. In a sense, you might say, they adopted a canon or a rule of Holy Scripture. That these words have come from God. They have come forth from the mouth of the Almighty. And they would obey them. We read sadly that they failed to do so. And that was their great transgression. But then, as they heard the voice of the Lord, they acknowledge what Moses had said. That those words came from the Lord. Then we turn to Ezra, chapter 9 and verse 4. Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. There was an acknowledgement that they had accessible to them the very words that God had spoken. Perhaps I should explain, I must move quite rapidly through this great array of scripture testimonies because the time is short. But I must not dwell at length upon the various passages that we come to just at present. Uh, we turn now to the to the Psalms and look in and Psalm 100 and Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. We don't need to apply a process of purification to the word of God. It comes to us in a state of purity as a revelation from God, just as if it had been like silver, refined in the furnace seven times over to ensure its utter purity. God has spoken and he has preserved his word and we have it set before us in the Holy Spirit. Psalm 107 and verse 11. Such as, uh, in the previous verse, such as sin in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebel against the words of God and contend the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart in them. And we can record there of the judgments and chastisements of God upon the people who turned aside from his words uh, or questioned his divine origin and authority. Psalm 119 and verse 130. The entrance of thy words give it light, to give it understanding unto the simple. This is just a reminder of the testimonies of the psalmist, particularly in this psalm, regarding the divine origin and the divine perfection of God's word. Notice in 
no one could doubt, reading the 119th Psalm, that the psalmist was convinced that God had spoken. And that it was his high privilege to, to tell forth the words of the living God. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 15. But I am the Lord thy God, that divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name, and I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand. And so I have put my word in thy mouth. Now that is the most explicit statement. And the revelation of God was communicated by God to his servant including the words in which that revelation uh, was to be delivered to the people. God said, I have put my words in thy mouth. Uh, and this is repeated in other scriptures. We turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So that if anyone were to ask us, what precisely do we mean when we talk about the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures? We could answer the question uh, in the terms in which the answer is given in the words of the prophet. God has spoken. God had put his words into their mouth. He had given his word by divine inspiration. The word had gone forth out of his mouth. And that is more than once declared in the history. The words were put into the mouths of his servants. They declared them and subsequently wrote them. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of the church. The prophet reverent knowledge of the divine source of the revelation, and that it was his privilege and his responsibility to hear the words of the Lord, and then to deliver them to the people. Chapter 26 and verse 2. Thus said the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house all the words that I command thee to speak unto thee. Diminish not a word. Diminish not a word. I'm reminded of when Moses spoke concerning the Lord. He said, God spake all these words. And the Lord said to Jeremiah, Diminish not a word. Speak all the words that I command thee. And in chapter 36 and verse 2. <clears throat> Take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. Take a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee. Then we come to chapter 23, and verse 28. Prophet that hath a dream, let him tell the dream. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the charm to the people? God has spoken. He has given his word by divine inspiration. He has given us a revelation of himself and at his command that has been written down. And so that we have gathered together in the pages of our Bibles the testimony of God communicated to us through the instrumentality of his chosen servant in words which the Holy Ghost gave by divine 
is provision. We remember uh, other testimonies such as those of the psalmist David, who said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. And the testimony of Paul, who writes to the Corinthians in the first epistle of chapter 2, and says, These things we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Many words which the Holy Spirit teaches. The revelation, the principle of the inspiration extends to the word, as well as to the substance and the main structure and outline of the various portions of the revelation. And when the apostle Paul describes his ministry at that moment uh, to the Corinthians, uh, in which he was engaged for about 18 months, as you read in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, he says, When I came unto you, declaring unto you the testimony of God. That's how he described it. But not giving my testimony as an apostle, but declaring unto you the testimony of God. These things we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches. So in the Holy Scriptures, we have the testimony of God concerning himself, concerning his Son, uh, concerning his purposes, concerning ourselves, uh, our guilt, concerning redemption, and concerning all the great doctrines of the Bible, concerning the past and the present and the future, concerning uh, creation, providence, and grace, uh, we have the testimony of God given in words of his own choice and given by inspiration, by the breath of God, the word of God Paul, out of his mouth. And the Holy Scriptures speak to us expressly and bid us uh, for instance, in the uh, words of the epistles of the Hebrews, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for it is God who has given us his word by divine inspiration, and it is his purpose that we should receive it, uh, and dwell upon it, reverently, by faith and by means of it, look unto Jesus, and grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, <coughs> Jesus Christ. Is it not just a a barren technical um, matter. Uh, merely an article in a basis of faith or a credo uh, statement, but a declaration that God has given us, many declarations concerning the divine origin and authority of his word, to be the ground of our confidence uh, in that divine revelation and to encourage us often to turn to it. Uh, and draw from it as uh, spiritual food and drink and nourishment and enrichment that we need, that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of our sin. No one could dwell at length upon the subject of divine inspiration and the implication of it. But in the course of this lecture, I have been asked, particularly, to touch upon uh, what is described as the, the canon of Holy Spirit. How do we come to recognize uh, as the divinely inspired word of the living God, the books of the Old Testament and the books of the New Testament, uh, and no more and no less? Why do we not receive the books of the Apocrypha? That I should deal with that question first. Those books described as the Apocrypha. were never part of the Hebrew Bible. They were never regarded as part of that sequence of divine revelations given in the law and the prophets and the Psalms, the other writings gathered under those three main titles. They were not part of the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures. They were written somewhat later in Greek uh, at a time when the Hebrew Old Testament had been translated into Greek for the benefit of the Jewish communities in North Africa, particularly in Alexandria, where there was a large and uh, flourishing Jewish community using the Greek language, which had been well established then uh, for some time. And there was a translation of the Old Testament scriptures into Greek, and perhaps not surprising, that body of book. Uh, known as the Apocrypha, uh, 
in the Greek language and touching upon religious matters as well as historical matters came to be kept together with the collection of the Greek books of the Old Testament on the translation. Uh, and in course of time, the Greek New Testament books um, were produced all in the period long before the law of printing. Manuscripts were multiplied containing the Greek translation of the Old Testament as well as the Hebrew. The, those apocryphal books that I've described and the New Testament books. But we find that the Lord Jesus Christ never quotes from any of those so-called apocryphal books. And the apostles never quote from them. And they receive no seal of divine authority, either from the Lord Jesus Christ or his apostles. And they were not regarded as scripture by the Jews. And they were not regarded as scripture by the Christians. And they had their use as being interesting historical, to some extent historical records, uh, to some extent uh, highly fanciful um, imagine, uh, imaginative matter, uh, much of it um, not at all profitable. <laughs> Those books were not regarded as scripture, either by the Jew or by the Christian. But in course of time, when they came to be the scriptures, the Greek scriptures came to be translated into Latin, because of the normal practice of keeping the Greek Old Testament, the Greek Apocrypha, and the Greek New Testament together, they were translated into Latin and other ancient languages. When, during the Reformation, the Protestant Church had made it clear that they did not regard that body of books as part of the Holy Scriptures given by divine inspiration. The Roman Catholic Church, by its decrees of the Council of Trent, determined its own position and required, uh, as an article of faith, the acceptance of those apocryphal books as part of the inspired Scripture. As far as the Church of Rome is concerned, that is the end of that is one of the um, highly important matters <coughs> in which the Protestant churches are part in company with the Roman Catholic. How do we come to receive the books of the Old Testament and the books of the New? Now, on this subject, as it is such an extensive one, and in some respect rather a technical one, uh, and in connection with it, I want to quote. Uh, in detail, uh, a number of statements and a number of dates. Uh, I decided I would not rely entirely upon my memory. So I have jotted down a little summary of some of this information uh, and with the aid of what I've written here, really as an aid to my memory, I will try and communicate some of this material to you. Um, tracing the reception of this revelation uh, in the church through the ages. And I think we should begin with the definition. People talk about the canon of Holy Scripture. And they have no idea what the word means. It's not a word that we commonly use in our speech. Although some people might have adopted it and talk about canons of good conduct, uh, canons of honesty, canons of courtesy, meaning rules. The normal rules of courtesy and good conduct and honesty and so on. And that is precisely what it means. The Greek canon was a rod or a measuring rule or a surveyor's staff. With reference to scripture, the canon means the rule acknowledging the authority of the books received as the word of God or the list of books so acknowledged. Athanasius, who was the great defender of the faith, the Trinitarian doctrine of the Bible, uh, against the, those who rejected that truth in the fourth century. Athanasius uses this word, canon, in his 39th Paschal letter 
in the uh, AD 367, Haskell when he wrote it at what we would call Easter time. But that really was the time of the concert. And it is described as his Haskell And a very appropriate description. In the year 367, and he uses the word cannon or cano in reference to the books of the Holy Scriptures. And since then, it has been used in Greek and Latin uh, and in our own language as canon in reference to the Holy Scriptures. And it commonly uh, occurs in all the great reformed statements of faith in relation to Scripture. The Holy Scriptures, as we have seen, come to us sealed with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 17 and verse 8, the Lord Jesus says, The words which thou gavest me, I have given them. He constantly directs his hearers to the law, the Psalms, and the prophets, as scripture, which cannot be broken. He quotes those scriptures, and the scripture cannot be broken, the Lord Jesus says. Those scriptures come to us with the authority of the apostles. In the first epistle of Peter, chapter 1, and verse 23, Peter refers to the word of God. Being born again, he said of the believer, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It is the word of God. 2 Peter 121. He says those who wrote it were moved by the Holy Ghost. Holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And he says in the first chapter of his first epistle, mercy then, that the prophets who prophesy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ uh, were searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ. Peter is saying those were moved by the Spirit of Christ who was in them. So Peter is acknowledging the divine origin of those Old Testament scriptures, just as the Lord Jesus did. And in the third chapter of the second epistle, and this is why I chose that brown reading, he says that you might be mindful of the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles. This Old Testament and New Testament division of the collection of books. Before any canon or rule was formulated by men, the authority of the word was asserted by the scriptures themselves. John chapter 6 and verse 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And John 5, 24, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. So much is attributed to the word spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 13 and verse 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, my words shall not pass away. The apostles received their authority from Christ and recognized that authority in each other. Peter says that Paul's teachers rested the words of Paul as they did the other scriptures. That's very significant. He is saying that Paul in those epistles, was writing scripture that we recognize uh, as of equal authority with the Old Testament. Uh, and those uh, who were twisting the words of Paul were just doing what they had done to the other scripture, uh, the Old Testament scripture. Uh, and this is the apostolic acknowledgement of the divine authority of the words written by inspiration by the apostles, as by the scripture. And Peter, in that chapter, refers to all of all epistles as a body of epistles, as a recognized body of Holy Scripture, given by inspiration of God, all his epistles. Paul himself claims to speak in words which the Holy Ghost teaches. He commends the Thessalonians receiving his word as the word of God and not as the word of man. He gave instruction that his epistle to the Colossians be read by the Laodicean. 
But he would part with the scripture. He tells the Corinthians that he has the Spirit of God. Thus the authority of the apostolic writings was acknowledged before any rule of the church demanded it. And we need to be clear in our minds about that. There is an inherent authority in scripture. The authority is not stamped upon the scripture by the church. What we're talking about now is just the uh, history, the recognition uh, of the divine authority of the scriptures in the church. The church has never given authority to the Holy Scripture. The authority is there because God has spoken and the word has gone forth out of his mouth. Uh, spokesmen and writers on behalf of the Roman church have sometimes claimed that we receive the Bible from the church. We need to be clear that we receive it from the Lord. After the apostles, in the second century, early Christian writers show that they acknowledged the Old Testament, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Gospels and the Epistles. And there is abundant evidence that the early church acknowledged the inherent authority of Scripture. The church did not bestow that recognized it. Ignatius, in the year 110, writes, hold fast the precepts of the Lord and his apostles, an early allusion to the Gospels and the Epistles. Polycarp, in 156, directs the Philippians to the example of Paul and the other apostles as authorities to be respected in the churches. Serapian of Antioch in 362 wrote, we accept Peter and the other apostles as we accept Christ. <laughs> as plainly as that, they were acknowledged that they received what were written uh, by those apostles and the inspiration of the spirits, having the authority, the same authority as in Christ himself has spoken those words. And Clement of Rome, in the middle of the second century, put the apostles on the same level as the prophets. So the early church acknowledged, one, the Old Testament, two, the Lord Jesus Christ, his word recorded in the Gospels, three, the apostles, who wrote the various New Testament epistles. And they would refer sometimes to scripture in the second century as a prophet, the Lord, and the apostles. In course of time, the Gospels and the epistles came to be recognized then as a second the Old Testament and the New Testament. When any New Testament book was questioned or rejected, authoritative statements or decrees were issued in various provinces of the church to correct the error. Those decrees did not originate the authority of those books, but merely <laughs> confirmed it. This is made clear in some of the reformed confessions of faith in later times. The Belgic Confession of 1561, these books alone we receive as sacred and canonical, on which our faith can rest, by which it can be confirmed and established. And we believe all the things that are contained in them, not because the Church receives and approves them as canonical, but because the Holy Spirit witnesses to our consciences that they emanated from God, and on this account also that the scriptures themselves sufficiently witness to and approve their proper authority. And that would have been written in the first century. The Belgic Confession of 1561. The Westminster Confession, 1643. The authority of the Holy Scriptures, for which it ought to be believed and obeyed, dependeth not upon the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth itself, the author thereof, and therefore it is received, because it is the word of God. Our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the truth in our hearts. The 39 Articles of the Church of England in 1563, in Article 6, very clearly distinguishes the apocryphal from the canonical books of the Old and New Testament, the words used of whose authority was never any doubt in the church. And all 
Liberal reform confessions of faith contain similar declarations to those that I have just read. The first confession of faith of Baal in 1534, the first Helvetic confession in 1536, Calvin's Geneva Catechism in 1545, the second Helvetic confession in 1566, the Articles of the French Reformed Church in 1561, and the Swiss Declaration of 1675. That's a wonderful array of Protestant Reformed testimonies concerning the divine authority and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Roman Catholic Church opposed the Reformation and divided its teaching on a number of matters in the decrees of the Council of Trent. The decree of the 8th of April, 1546, insisted on the canonical status of the Apocrypha. Repeating earlier pronouncements, including the Council of Florence and the Bull uh, of Pope uh, Eugenius uh, the Fourth of 1442, the Vatican Council of 1870 uh, repeated the decree of Trent, fixing the Apocrypha as part of the canon. And according to Roman Catholic scholars, those decrees of Trent and the Vatican Council are infallible and irreformable decision of the magisterium. For the Roman Catholic, the Council of Trent is the end of the history of the Council, and you have the Apocrypha uh, enshrined in it. Trent, nevertheless, did recognize as canonical the 27 books which comprise our own New Testament. Remember again, None of those decrees, Protestant or Roman Catholic, impart any authority to the Holy Scriptures. They merely recognize it. Now we'll consider some historical evidence of the recognition of the New Testament books. Four Gospels were written before the end of the first century, and soon afterwards were widely circulated beyond the countries of origin and the countries for which they were intended. Matthew, first distributed among Jews in Syria and Palestine, Mark, for Jews in Rome and Italy, Luke, for Jews in Italy and Africa. John, we know, was known in Middle Egypt soon after AD 100. Papyrus number 52 is a short portion of the Gospel according to John, and it belongs to that period. All four Gospels were known to the author of an apocryphal gospel in Egypt about AD 150. Now we've dismissed these apocryphal books uh, as, as if they had no value. But in some respects they had a historical value. Uh, if it can be demonstrated that someone, if they could not sound that, uh, in writing in the year 150 AD, and he refers to a body of books that were recognized commonly in the Christian church. It is an early historical evidence of that fact the fragment of an unknown gospel of that period. There are indications that four gospels were known already in a, in a collection of four books <coughs> constituting part of the canon of Holy Scripture. Uh, Papias, who was Bishop of Hierapolis in Phrygia in AD 130, knew Matthew and Mark and John. He doesn't quote Luke, but that is not to say that he was not aware uh, of the gospel of Luke. The four gospels were probably made into one collection in Asia Minor in the reign of Hadrian between 117 and 138 AD. Justin Martyr in 165 AD shows in his writings that he knew them all. These writers acknowledge four Gospels and only four, and they do not quote from any apocryphal Gospel, only from the four canonical. And then they began to use the expression in relation to New Testament writing as it is written, a formula that will be used in relation to Old Testament scripture, as it is written, as it is written. They began to use that in relation to the New Testament in the middle of the second century. Writers began to quote from the gospel with that formula normally used to introduce quotations from the Old Testament. Clement quotes Matthew 22, 14. As it is written, he says, many are called, a few chosen. Clement does not impart authority to that text in Matthew, but he recognizes that Matthew is scripture. 
Another writer of that period says, another scripture says, I'm not sent to call the righteous, but sinners to repent of me. Quoting Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13 as another scripture. So those people who were accustomed to describing the Old Testament as scripture were now describing the New Testament as scripture. The Didache, D I D A C D A C D A C describes the teaching of the apostles and the writings of Clement contain such expressions as the Lord said, the Lord has commanded us in his gospel. And from such references we see that only the four canonical gospels were recognized in the church from the beginning. <coughs> then Tatian wrote a harmony of the gospels, the Theotessalon as it was called before AD 170, he wove the narratives of all four Gospels into one continuous harmony or narrative, using only the four canonical Gospels. Now there were many other writings current at the time, which we would dismiss as apocryphal. in his harmony, used only those four. His other writings show that he was familiar with sayings not found in the four Gospels, but he never quotes other things with the formula the scripture said. Justin Martyr tells us that as early as AD 155, it was the practice to read publicly from the Gospels in the service of the church, uh, just as it was the practice uh, among um, Jews in the early, early period uh, to read from the law. Uh, and there's a recognition of the divine authority and origin. The epistles of Paul were known as a recognized and authoritative body of writing when Peter wrote his epistles. As we've already seen, he informs us in 2nd Epistle chapter 3, verse 15, uh, that Paul had written epistles, and he refers to all his epistles, and classifies them as scripture side by side with the other scriptures. The epistles were rapidly disseminated, and it is probable and late in the first century or early in the second, there were collections of Paul's epistles available in the churches before the Gospels had been formed into a collection of four Gospels together. Ignatius of Antioch in 110 AD refers to 1 Corinthians, Romans, Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, 1 Timothy, and 1 Thessalonians. Justin Martyr. In 165 AD, refer to Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, and Hebrews, and refers to the epistles as authoritative scripture. No ancient writer quotes as pouring anything that cannot be found in our Pauline epistles. That also is very simple. You comb through the writings of those very ancient writers, belonging to the very earliest period of the Christian church, when they're quoting the epistles of Paul, they don't quote anything that you could not find in the epistle that you had in your Bible. The order may vary in their collections, but not the content. Clement of Rome uses Hebrew, Polycarp and Papias in the second century use one Peter and one John. Papias knew the revelation. We can trace the acknowledgement and use of the whole range of New Testament books from the first and second century. And according to Eusebius, a whole canon, including the Old Testament and the New Testament, is recognized about 180 AD and described as the Holy Scripture of the Old and New Testament. And the title, the New Testament, was used in 1892 by a writer who wrote against the Montanists in North Africa. When the authority of any part of scripture was called in question, the church had to correct the error and define its position and make a rule about it. A canon. Making the rule didn't naturally empower the authority. It had to remind them to those who deviated uh, from the uh, acknowledgement which had been uh, common to the churches from the beginning. But they were stepping out of line uh, and there had been a 
continuous acknowledgement of that divine authority of the Holy Scripture which was inherent in themselves from the beginning. Marcion of Pontus was received into the church at Rome in AD 139 and ejected for heresy in 144. Uh, he rejected the Old Testament. He saw the Old Testament revelation of an avenging God of justice. And he accepted only the New Testament given by Jesus Christ, whom he describes as the Father of mercy. I don't have time to refer to a sad mistranslation in the Living Bible, where um, we read in a particular passage, Moses only gave us the law. The law was given by Moses, the place and truth came by Jesus Christ, as we have it in the Lord's language. In the Living Bible, Moses only gave us the law, with its rigid demands and merciless justice. Which the law authority anyway. With rigid demands and merciless justice. But Jesus gives us loving forgiveness as well. Quite unconsciously, I imagine, and Mr. Taylor, who was responsible for the translation, was just repeating the heresy of Master, describing the Old Testament God as the God of merciless justice, uh, and the New Testament God as the God of mercy. Whereas if he read the law a little more carefully, he would see that right in the middle of the law it says that God shows mercy. Uh, well, the reference to the Living Bible perhaps is hardly relevant to the subject, but it does illustrate the point. And these errors from ancient times sometimes become revived uh, in these latter times. To Marcion, Paul was the only true ambassador of Christ. So he accepted some of Paul's epistles, and he accepted only Luke because he was the And he excluded the pastoral epistles and accepted only ten of the Pauline epistles. Someone had to tell Marcion and his followers that the church had always acknowledged four of us and not only one. Uh, Irenaeus in southern Gaul wrote his great work against heresies in the years 180 to 190 AD, possibly earlier. And in that work he acknowledges 22 of the New Testament including four Gospels. He condemns Marcion for using only Luke. He condemns Cyrillus for using only Mark. And the Valentinians for using only John. There were heretics of four classes who admitted only one Gospel. And Irenaeus insists that the Church recognizes four Gospels. It's in this way that the, the canon of Holy Scripture developed. Those who resisted the truth or rejected some part of it had to be reminded that there was an authority in human, in the scriptures, so to be recognized from the beginning. Many of the heresies of that period are embraced by Jehovah's Witnesses and other cults today. Though those cults may say we don't reject any of the gospels, but they do embrace many of the heresies of that earlier period. I will come to make a brief mention of an important document known as the Muratorian was found by a man named Nora Torai in Milan, and published in 1740. It was written in the 7th or 8th century, but that was a Latin translation of a much earlier Greek document, containing a list of the canonical books. It must have been written in the 2nd century, as the author describes a book with the title of The Shepherd of Hermes, as composed shortly before our time, when Bishop Pius was in the Sea of Rome, and that was between 142 and 144 AD. And his list includes nearly all our New Testament, with some qualifying thoughts on Revelation, Hebrews, and 1 Peter. Although Irenaeus, Tertullian, the Heaven of Alexandria, and Hippolytus all recognize 1 Peter, and we could read other authorities for Revelation and Hebrews. Hippolytus of Rome in 235. And Tertullian in North Africa in 220, both compiled lists of accredited books. And it must be seen that before that period, the Western Church had a collection of apostolic writings which were read in public worship and 
recognized as an equal authority in the Old Testament. Hippolytus wrote to Peter. James was known certain between 1890 and 150, but not finally recognized throughout the Western Church until 350 AD. Hebrews 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, James, Jude, and Revelation were recognized in the West after the 4th century. The Eastern Church, Clement of Alexandria in 215, and Oregon in 185 to 259, left writings showing that they knew all 27 New Testament books, that they rejected apocryphal gospels, that they may have shown some measure of respect for the Episcopal Fathers. Dionysius of Alexandria in 264 denied the apostolic origin of revolution and influenced churches in Palestine, Syria, and Asia Minor to reject the revolution, with the result that they were accepted in Antioch and Palestine until the 6th century. In the 5th century, the Syrian churches followed other provinces in accepting all seven general epistles as Asia Minor had in the 4th century. Tatian's harmony of the Gospels, in which the four narratives were woven together, continued to be used in the Syrian churches, but not replaced by the separate Gospels until AD 457, when Theodoratus removed 200 copies from the churches in his diocese and insisted they should read from the separate Gospels, and that those were the authoritative and divine revelation. And in 412, Rabula of Edessa insisted on the use of four separate Gospels, and the Lewis Syriac, 400 AD, includes in that Syriac translation the four Gospels, the Acts, 14 epistles of Paul with Hebrews, incidentally, as number five on the list, in the middle of the body of 14 epistles. The Eastern Church, affected by the Nestorian heresy, which recognized only 22 books and retained the western part of the Syrian church accepted only four of the general epistles, and later accepted all 27 of them. In one part of the continent after another, the 27 books established their authority, apart from continuing argument about the authorship, rather than the canonicity of the epistles of Hebrews, which does not begin with the usual format or the apostle of Jesus Christ. Eusebius of Caesarea, in 340 AD, has three groups of books. One, the books unanimously acknowledged. Two, the books sometimes challenged, James, Jude, and 2 Peter, and 2 and 3 John. Three apocryphal books to be rejected as spurious. Even Luther, Calvin, and Erasmus expressed doubts on the canonicity of some of the epistles. But there are good grounds for receiving all 27 books of the New Testament as the divinely inspired revelation of God. Athanasius, in that 39th uh, patriarchal and pastoral letter, in 367 AD, lists all 27 New Testament books and writes, These are the sources of our salvation. From here, the thirsty soul may make rich use of the words to be found in them. In these alone is the doctrine of piety recorded. No one may add, and no one may take away from them. And that we would endorse. God has given us his word and imparts to it a self-evidencing power. God is able to convince us inwardly of the authority of his word. The history of the canon records only the process by which the church acknowledged it. In closing, I would remember the purpose for which the scriptures are given. According to the Apostle John, these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. May God add his blessing to his word. I may never just to show how uh, the view that we hold when we assert the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures is one has been held by all those witnesses who we have quoted in a continuous line going right back to the days uh, of the apostles and the days in which the Lord Jesus Christ 
the Son of God, which is how we can have the man and blood of the Lord. the Lord enable us to receive those testimonies and to walk with the reading of his word. I speak of as a trained coach, the trains will not wait. And we therefore must briefly say that we do value what he has set before us. We found it refreshing and informative, and I feel holy to the purpose in heaven. We do thank you indeed and pray that what has been said might have the Lord's blessing. Now, therefore, we will conclude by singing hymn number 352. 352. The moon and stars shall lose their light, the sun shall sink in endless night, both heaven and earth shall pass away, the words of Nature all decay, but in number three hundred and fifty two.